And welcome to a slightly precarious edition of Ben's Junk. Well, if you saw the recent How I Spent My Summer video, you saw a fairly lengthy segment on my, at the time, barely alive, Pioneer Centrex RH65 8-track deck. And uh, I've got it as restored as I possibly can. Took me a while. And uh, it looks like that this will become the Archive's new resident 8-track deck, so uh, success, I guess. But uh, anyway, if you saw the aforementioned How I Spent My Summer video, some of this is going to be redundant, but let me just go over this deck and why I picked it up again, and I'll try to keep it brief. The Montgomery Ward deck that i had been using for the last several years now has been giving me progressively more problems. I mean, it works in a pinch, but it's pretty fussy. So I set about looking for a new, to me, unit, and I had five basic criteria. One, it needed to have VU meters uh, for both shallow and practical purposes. Uh, shallow in that when I run audio-only stuff on archive, it's nice to have something to look at that, you know, moves a bit. Practical in that it would be nice to gauge both playback and recording levels. Which brings us to number two, recording capability, even though I rarely use it. Number three, I wanted Dolby noise reduction. And uh, I do have a precious few Dolby encoded tapes, and it would be nice to play them as intended. Then, number four, I wanted one with auto stop. And that's just so I'm not racing for the machine at the end of a program, especially if it's my first time playing a tape and I need to check the foil splice, you know, that holds the whole thing together. And lastly, number five, I wanted a deck that would be easily serviceable. And to the best of my reading, the best performing decks that are also user serviceable were the Pioneer RH60, which is just this without Dolby, up through the HR100. And uh, no, I'm not going in chronological order there. But anyway, these decks, from what I've read at least, used primarily generic as opposed to proprietary parts, and just had things like the belts in accessible places. So anyway, uh, yes, this was another flea bay deal, and I knew it was going to be something of a fixer-upper, and uh, the seller took all sorts of lovely pictures of this, but of course pictures are never a substitute for in-person and as it turned out, the machine had a little case of smoker's patina, uh, as one of my viewers calls it. And yeah, I'm totally stealing that. But on top of that, I've got a feeling that this just wasn't stored under ideal conditions, shall we say. But uh, as you could well imagine, it took me the better share of a day to just give this thing a basic preliminary cleaning uh, inside and out. All right, apologies for the guerrilla style shooting here, but it's the only way I can get into everything. So anyway, after doing some initial testing, I was just ready to chuck this thing in the trash. Uh, tapes would only play if they sat in the machine in a very special way. So I'd have to put it in and then pull it back out, maybe 5% or so, uh, just to get it going. And uh, this is not plugged in right now, and yes, that is by design. But anyway, uh, the on one of those early tests, this uh, formerly straight little plastic bit here, it was just a little uh, cube-esque thing, uh, it just exists to make these little pieces of metal make contact, and that's because that is the program switch which lets you kick between one and two and three and four. So I had to very awkwardly rebuild that out of the original part, a lot of crazy glue and some very tiny pieces of duct tape, but it seems to work. It hasn't shifted on me or anything. 
But uh, since we're talking programs here, underneath this orange hunk of plastic is the program switching mechanism, which makes the head, uh, you know, pop down. You know, one up top, then two, then three, then four. And uh, so the machine was also hissing at me a lot, whether or not I had a tape in or not. But anyway, I, I was talking about the program switching deal. So it's largely obscured by the orange here, but I wind up having to pretty much take it apart. Um, the old lube, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get the camera in there. The old lube had turned to glue, so I had to clean all that off and of course redo the lube. And this plastic is only held on by these bent pieces of metal, so I had to be very gentle with that. Uh, by some miracle, they didn't snap on me or anything. So let me get back up here. So anyway, uh, moving on to belts. Uh, this is just the counter belt. But uh, the one screw that holds the bracket in place that keeps me from getting to the drive belt, which is on the underside, I'd have to turn this whole thing over. Uh, that had corroded in place. And thankfully, a little liquid wrench took care of that. Uh, at least I didn't have to outright drill the screw out this time. I've had to do that before, and that sucks. But anyway, uh, to my amazement, the new belts cured 90% of this thing's ills. The playback is still a hair slow, but it's well within spitting distance of accurate. Uh, I can't seem to find anything on here to adjust motor speed, and uh, there's nothing referencing it in the service manual. But uh, my conspiracy theory is that the speed is dictated by drive belt tension. So anyway, moving on, um, we'll, we'll come back to this. This nut here is uh, the crosstalk adjustment. Now, um, calibration tapes, test tapes for 8-track are crazy rare. And obviously I don't have any. So I had to tune everything by ear, and this uh, crosstalk bit, uh, which is so adjacent programs don't bleed into each other, uh, see last week's record ripoffs episode for a good example of that, um, I had to do this completely offline because the pliers I was using kept slipping, and I kept touching this little screw up there, and of course I was getting sparks. So that took me a while. But uh, anyway, I wound up not trying to calibrate the Dolby and the potentiometers are somewhere underneath the rat's nest there. But that's because I had nothing to stack it up against. And uh, for what it's worth, commercial pre-recorded Dolby encoded tapes actually sound decent. Not great or anything, but decent. And I figured I'd better just not screw with it. But uh, having said that, my own recordings, uh, Dolby or not, sound pretty bad on this thing. Uh, they're pretty shaky, but uh, you'll get to hear that later. On a purely cosmetic level, I did what I could with the front faceplate. Uh, a basic cleaning just did absolutely nothing here. So I wound up using some Novus Scratch Remover and a bit of Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to at least try and mellow the scratches and blemishes a bit. Now, the lid was pretty badly scratched, and I wound up just going over that with some matte black spray paint. Uh, I didn't even try to get the old paint off. And this thing's from about 1978, so I guess the potential for lead paint is still there. And uh, bottom line, it just wasn't worth the struggle. But uh, yes, if you look at it just right, in just the right light, you can still see kind of the craters uh, from the scratches. But you do have to be looking for them. But uh, whatever, I mean, after today, nobody's ever going to see that lid but me. Now, there are still some issues. For example, this has an intermittent problem with the VU meters. 
Uh, for a while, for whatever strange reason, for the first two or three plays after giving this a cleaning, the just one VU meter, and it would alternate between left and right, would get stuck at 100 or 50%, regardless of whether or not there was anything playing at the moment. But uh, having said that, I have been spending a little time with this thing every day for several days now, uh, plus all the time I spent with it uh, during the How I Spent My Summer deal. And, I mean, I have cleaned the guide, the head, and the cap stand several times now, many times now. And the VU meter thing hasn't been giving me as much trouble for a couple days now, so uh, knock on wood, or a veneer, as it were. But anyway, uh, I do have a couple of uh, annoyances with this unit's general design. One being that there is no power button, and it only comes alive if there's a tape in there. And, I mean, I can kind of see why Pioneer did that. Uh, I'm sure they saw a power button as just redundant. But nonetheless, I personally still would have liked one just for knowing that it's alive. But uh, then my real big gripe with this is that there is no headphone jack on this thing. Uh, this is strictly phono. But anyway, despite that, on the whole, it still performs better than the Montgomery Ward deck, which is now my backup deck. And uh, yeah, I think this is going to be the Archive's 8-track workhorse for the foreseeable future. Not that you'll be seeing it a whole lot. I mean, 8-track uh, is probably my least favorite major audio format to deal with. But uh, anyway, uh, that is almost it for today. I will leave you with some assorted recording and playback tests, but uh, otherwise I will talk to you again soon. Oh, hey, Ben. How's it going? Oh, hey, Ben. Yeah. I'm all right. How's things over on the left channel? Eh, you know, same old, same old. How's things on the right? Eh, same junk, different day. Well, nice chatting with you. Yep, we gotta do this again sometime. Hey, Ben, how do I sound? Well, Ben, you sound like you're under a heavy, wet blanket. And so do I. Oh, yeah, that's the Dolby. The Dolby? What's that? Some kind of cheese? No, it's a method of noise reduction. You can say that again, taking some of the intentional noise with it.
That's the way I was caged in the talk. In fact, uh, I know a lot of other wonderful words to learn at least from my vocabulary that we use all the time. And these are nothing but a little mild expletive stuff, like if and that and so. And we mean nothing about it when we use them. But there may be one people here tonight that doesn't believe that, and I may have offended someone. So if I did, I want you to forgive me and pardon me because I didn't mean to, and I apologize. Doesn't that sound nice, actually? I don't give a damn. <laughs>